Uh, Seth read chapter 42. I'm not going to read chapter 43, but I'm going to refer to it during the sermon. Uh, so please make sure you have your Bibles there. Uh, sermon outline inside your newsletter. Uh, as Mary said, this is our sixth year in Genesis. If you are new to Genesis, there are five years of sermons for you to listen to and watch online. Let me encourage you to do that uh, at any time of the day. Uh, feel free to do that. Uh, one of the things that surprises a lot of people about God's Word, the Bible, is that every page you turn to has dysfunction. Every page you turn to has dysfunctional people walking around. From the very first family, which was dysfunctional as one brother killed another, right through to the family of the Son of God, when Mary and his siblings turned up, declaring that Jesus was out of his mind, dysfunction is everywhere in God's Word. And dysfunctional people walk on every page. Now, really, it shouldn't surprise us, should it? Because the Bible is God's revelation of what he's going to do about that dysfunction, about God's word into a broken world. And as we sit here today, we know that if we're honest with ourselves, dysfunction is everywhere in our lives, isn't it? Dysfunction is everywhere in our world. Uh, when you read through the reviews of the latest albums and the latest films in the Sydney Morning Herald and the Australian on the weekend, dysfunction fuels our entertainment, doesn't it? Dysfunction is our daily experience. Dysfunction is our existence. And dysfunction is our eternal problem. How is that dysfunction going to be dealt with? Uh, How do we deal with our own dysfunctionality? How do we deal with the dysfunction we so obviously see in other people? And how do we deal with the dysfunction of the whole world? We're going to touch on that today. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you that your word is unvarnished. It doesn't avoid the truth. It exists in a world where there's blood and sorrow and lament alongside joy and magnificence and rest. Father, thank you that you not only speak into this world, but you have never neglected this world and you walk into this world. Father, please confront us with how you deal with dysfunction today. Amen. Well, as Mary pointed out, uh, six years, how do you summarise that? Can you imagine how long this sermon's going to be? We're at point two on the outline. Uh, How would you summarise what we've seen in Genesis? Let me tell you, it comes down to three truths. Genesis reveals how the world came to be, how the world was broken, how the world will be fixed. How the world came to be, how the world was broken, how the world is going to be fixed. Genesis reveals the world came to be when God spoke. God didn't have to do that. It was his decision. But he spoke the world into existence so that it would reflect and proclaim him. And God made us as his image bearers to rule the world under his word in community with him. Genesis reveals how that world came to be broken. It was when humans said, actually, God, I think I can do a better job than you. I I want to be God and you're not God. And that's going to be my attitude and my action. We see that in Adam and Eve where they doubt the generosity and goodness of God. Actually, God, I'm gonna. you've given me the whole garden to eat from, but actually I just want to disobey you because I want that truth and I can do it better than you. It breaks the world and it brings God's right and true judgment. It it is our nature, our existence. And then Genesis reveals how God committed, how God commits to restoring the world. God does it out of his grace. It's undeserved. At the moment, the world deserves his judgment. He displays his kindness. God commits to this restoration through a particular family, Abraham's family. At the point where Abraham is tapped on the shoulder by God, Abraham is turning his back to God. And God says, I'm going to use your family, Abraham, to reverse the curse of sin in the world. Bring my people back to me. God commits to this world in a covenant, a binding agreement between two or more people that he expresses to Abraham. And what does Abraham do in all this? He takes God at his word and he acts like it. He obeys him. He trusts him. That binding agreement is passed to Abraham's son Isaac. 
then to Isaac's boy Jacob. At every point when you look at this family's history, what are they? They're dysfunctional. They're all over the place. At each point, the family receives God's grace. They trust him. Uh, Who initiates all this? God does. Uh, God initiates everything. In fact, this is the pattern of God's commitment to all the world all the time. By now, this dysfunctional family has been divided. Jacob's sons have turned on each other. Uh, They've taken Joseph, beaten him up, sold him into slavery in Egypt. He's been restored by God. That's a process of 13 to 20 years separated from his family. And now he's ruling Egypt. Can you imagine that? He's in the lodge. He's greeting the king on the tarmac. He's been graciously cared for by God. He's been given insights into dreams that have enabled him to use what God has given him to care for others. Genesis 42, verse 1. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at each other? Listen, he went on. I've heard there's grain in Egypt. Go down there, buy some food for us so that we will live and not die. So 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he thought something might happen to him. Point three on the outline, uh, the previous section of Genesis has focused on Joseph, even though it's the account of Jacob. Now we return to Jacob and things are very grim. The dreams of Pharaoh have been foretold. The dreams of Pharaoh have come to fruition. Seven years of plenty. And in those seven years, Joseph has put into practice the skills of managing a household. And he has created a huge amount of wealth and abundance in Egypt. And yet it's spread to Jacob's land, this family. His family seems paralyzed. You can almost imagine the son. What are you boys doing? And so he rouses them with words that are a pretty rough rebuke. You guys are you're asleep on the job, fellas. What are you doing? Didn't you hear the Jerusalem news? There's food in Egypt. Go down there and get some. So 10 of the boys are sent. Now, we're meant to recognize that number, don't we? 10. How many boys does he have? 12. Well, one's already waiting for them in Egypt, though they don't know it. And the other one's too precious to send. And at this point, meet the family. <laughs> How dysfunctional are these guys? And remember that it's the favoritism of Jacob that's torn them apart. The father has failed. Twelve sons to two wives, ten to Leah, two to Rachel. But Jacob favours Rachel and her boys. That favoritism is corrosive. It's like rust on the family, but it digs deep into their bones and their blood and their attitudes. It's elevated the sons of Rachel It's turned brother against brother. It's destroyed the family. It's led to abuse and destruction, deceit. It's even led to the selling of a brother into slavery. Which Did that happen in our families this week? How dysfunctional is this mob? We think we're dysfunctional. And yet this family is in God's word. How dysfunctional. The brothers arrive in Egypt and Joseph sees them, 42 verse 7. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he treated them like strangers, spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked, from the land of Canaan to buy food, they replied. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Have you ever seen those images of the food being put out in Gaza and how everyone just rushes the truck? People in desperation, and that's this scene. But every country is there because only Egypt is okay. It's a really critical moment. Can you imagine being Joseph? The prime minister is there and he's overseeing this operation and as he looks up and he's got his clipboard there, he goes, that's my brothers. He recognises him. That word recognise is a crucial theme for chapter 42. They don't recognise him. Joseph recognises, Joseph knows, Joseph understands and so Joseph initiates everything and the brothers don't do a thing. Now don't be surprised about the recognition. It's been 13 to 20 years here and Joseph now looks like an Egyptian. He's Egyptian in every way. He's got a smooth face unlike his brothers who are unbelievably hairy. He's well fed, he's perfumed, he's groomed, he's well dressed, he's out of context. And as his brothers bow before him, as they seek grain and help, these smelly, hairy, emaciated men, Joseph remembers his dream. Did you hear that? 
Joseph remembers his dream from Genesis 37. But it's not a complete dream, is it? Because back there in Genesis 37, how many bowed down to him? Eleven, but there's only ten here. This is a masterful moment for Joseph to see if things have changed. Because the dream's not complete. And so on the basis of the dream, did you see that there? On the basis of the dream in verse 9, he tests them. Have these boys changed? Is there a prospect of reconciliation? How's his dad? What about his youngest brother? Have they done to Benjamin what they did to him? And so he tests them and he's quite open about them. He accuses them. He wheedles information out of them. He afflicts them. It's a severe mercy. But I think it's prompted by his desire for reconciliation to see if they've changed, to see if they've repented, turned from what they've done. He's quite open, verse 14. Do you see that? I'm testing you. Quite consistent in this. Uh, What I experienced for 13 to 20 years, you're going to have for three days. Quite focused in this. I want to know whether my younger brother and my father are okay. There's a purpose to this. The brothers respond. You see how they answer him in verse 13? They admit there's 12 of them. That's an honest answer, isn't it? They admit that there's still one back home. They admit that there's one who's dead. And so into chains they go for three days. Joseph is afflicting them with a severe mercy. But then Joseph releases them and he admits to them that he will have mercy on them. Do you notice that? I fear God. Did you hear that there? I fear God. And then when he responds to them, He doesn't keep all of them there and send one back. He keeps one there and sends the rest back. And when he sends them back, he sends them back with an abundance, not only food for when they get home, but food for the whole journey. That's a big expense. None of the other refugees experience that. And you notice that as this is all happening, look there in verse 21. Then they said to each other, obviously we're being punished for what we did to our brother. We saw his deep distress when he pleaded with us, but we wouldn't listen. That is why this trouble has come to us. Severe mercy has revealed genuine guilt. We're told not to feel guilty, aren't we, in our world? Don't don't feel guilty about being authentic. Don't feel guilty about pursuing your authentic self. These brothers had pursued their authentic selves, hadn't they? And it came at the expense of the life of their younger. But they've changed and this severe mercy on them has revealed their guilt. They recognise what they've done. There's nothing shallow here, is it? No, kind of, ah, gee, we got caught. No, no, these, these boys are genuinely guilty. They know the reality, the damage and the depth of their wrongdoing. They know what their dysfunction and their sin has brought and they are rent to the bottom of their hearts. And do you notice what happens? Verse 23, they did not realise that Joseph understood them. Since there was an interpreter between them, he turned away from them and wept. Do you notice how he responds to their guilt? This, This man three times in these chapters is so overcome with emotion that he bawls his eyes out because he's seeing what's happening in front of him. They've admitted their guilt. They've been open and truthful, but the severe mercy remains. Simeon is taken. They are sent home. The knowing of Joseph continues to prod and poke them so that the change within them is brought to the fore. And as they go home, it's time to feed the animals at the place where they lodge for the night, verse 27. One of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey. He saw his silver there at the top of his bag. He said to his brothers, my silver's been returned. It's here in my bag. Their hearts sank trembling. They turned to one another and said, what is this that God has done to us? Guilt and now fear. True guilt and true fear. These boys hadn't feared God before when they beat their brother and sold him into slavery when they indulge their dysfunction. But now it's hitting home, isn't it? Because they have a significant choice here. Joseph has put it before them in his severe mercy. If they are to return back to Egypt to get more grain, they return under the shadow of the accusation of thieves. Will they risk that for their family? Have they changed? And the fear here is not so much fear of the consequences. Who is the fear of here? It's the fear of God. It's the fear of the one who has made them. 
their sin has been against their brother but is committed against God. And they recognise their exposure. They recognise God's hand in this. They realise their guilt and they stand there naked in their hearts before God and they fear him rightly. Before when they dealt with their brother, there was no fear or guilt. Before as they lied to their father, there was no fear or guilt, but now they fear God. They are guilty and they acknowledge the rule of God and they must answer to him. They continue their journey, they arrive home and they it's almost as like they've had all that time in silence. Can you imagine walking through that desert back to Jacob? And they get there and Jacob opens the tent door and they just it just all comes tumbling out. The man in charge, do you notice how they describe Joseph? They start to unpack, they open the sacks of grain and what is in each sack? It's all their money. They're all thieves. They've all been afflicted by this severe mercy. Uh, the fear remains, the guilt remains, but do you notice that there is an abundance of sorrow at this point? Now, uh, Reuben and Jacob aren't great with words. They don't express it that well, do they? <laughs> but there is sorrow here, confronted by this severe mercy by the one in the know. There is a deep, deep sorrow, a sorrow at the loss of Joseph's life, a sorrow at the loss of the liberty of Simeon, a sorrow at the fracturing of relationships, a sorrow that has just exposed seemingly impossible decisions in front of them. Joseph is in the know, and as the one in the know, he brings severe mercies on these men, and these severe mercies expose a true guilt, a true fear of God, and a true sorrow, all the marks of repentance, genuine change. You see, there is hope that dysfunction can be overcome. There is hope that dysfunction can be overcome and restoration achieved. And so we have a break, probably two to three years, and then the start of 43, we meet the family again. Now the famine in the land was severe. When they had used up the grain they had brought back from Egypt, their father said to them, go back and buy us little food. Now uh, let me point out uh, the restoration takes a long time, doesn't it? <laughs> that, that's almost a replay of the start of 42, isn't it? Restoration takes a long time. They're still there. They're still struggling. So Jacob kicks the boys and says, boys, you're still asleep. Get down there. Probably been about two to three years since they last left Egypt. Can you imagine that? Simeon's been in jail for two to three years. They've had two to three years to have this eat at their hearts and minds, sleepless nights as they think about the decision, as they think about the change. And Jacob says, go down and Judah intervenes. Judah actually is the man who speaks wisdom, provides a sobering account. That man, he warned us, don't come back until you bring that youngest brother don't come back until I have news about your father. Don't come back. And in, in the midst of Jacob's self-pity and favoritism, Judah's words show that change can happen. Because last time we met Judah, what was he doing? He was sleeping with his daughter-in-law, wasn't he? Because he wouldn't take his responsibility seriously. Because he was living his best life now in the most authentic way. And he was revealed as a man who avoided all that was right and good and honest. And do you notice the change here in this cowardly, weak man? Do you notice the way he steps in and says, actually, I, I will be the guarantee for Benjamin? He would never have done that before, would he, this man? I, I will be the guarantee. Now, Jacob accepts what Judah says. And it's as if he has sprung into action there in verse 11. And we're meant to pick up the way in which there is an irony here. You see, Joseph was sold into Egypt in a caravan taking supplies and now reconciliation is about to happen as a caravan taking supplies comes back to Egypt with exactly the same supplies. Here is the change. And as they depart, do you notice what Jacob says there in verse 14? May God Almighty... Cause the man to be merciful to you so that he will release your other brother and Benjamin to you. As for me, if I'm deprived of my sons, then I'm deprived. Jacob now finally just rests in God. Do you notice that? A schemer, a deceiver, a liar, a planner goes, listen, God's in charge. 
If it's God's will, I trust him to do what is good. The brothers arrive. Joseph meets them. He notes that Benjamin is there. He turns to the head of his household, the steward, and says, go and get the house ready. The boys are going to eat with me tonight. The brothers are immediately alarmed. If you're taken into the lodge and you're told that everything is ready for you, what are you thinking if you've got a guilty conscience? They've returned. They fear they'll be arrested in prison, dealt with as thieves. So they immediately go to the head of the household, the steward, and they spill the truth. It is so clear and coherent. These boys have changed, haven't they? They've never been this truthful. And so they spill the beans, and they're honest and they're desperate. Look there in verse 23. Look there in verse 23 as they spill the beans. Then the steward said, may you be well. Don't be afraid. Your God and the God of your father must have put the treasure in your bags. I did receive your silver. and Here's Simeon. I think we miss this because we're working in English. But literally, the steward says, shalom, shalom. Have you ever heard that word? What does it mean? It means, no, it's not just peace. It is all the abundance and flourishing of life as God designed. I hope you got it. All the flourishing and life as God designed be with you. Can you imagine that? Here is this hairless, nice-smelling Egyptian using your national greeting to you. That's remarkable. And if recognising was the key word of the first section, shalom is the key word here. The steward knows exactly what's going on. He received their money and he put it back. It's all okay, gentlemen. In fact, it's so okay, here's Simeon. And the shalom keeps coming. Joseph comes back. Finally, there in verse 26, we have the dream fulfilled, 11 boys bowing to Joseph. Joseph speaks, and the word he uses as he asks after his father, he uses the word shalom twice. Joseph looks up and he sees Benjamin, and his words express the same concept, shalom. Everywhere you look, there is shalom. And Joseph is overcome as he sees all these things. Look there in verse 30. Joseph hurried out because he was overcome with emotion for his brother, about to weep. He went into a inner room and wept there. Here is the moment of restoration and reconciliation. Here is Shalom. Joseph never thought that he would sit at a meal with his brothers. And what happened when he left has been reversed. They ate a meal, they saw a caravan, they sold him. The caravan has come, they're eating a meal, and now they're restored. It's reversed. And so they sit down for the meal, and as they sit down, what do they see? Gee, you got all the place names in the right age order. And when he puts an abundance in front of Benjamin, what do they all say? Well, they don't get any anger at the favouritism. They just drink and enjoy. Here is restoration. Guilt, fear and sorrow leading to shalom. I'm at the last point on the outline. We deal with dysfunction every day, don't we? It'll happen every day this week in our hearts, in our workplaces, on the touch footy field, with our friends, on social media. There'll be dysfunction everywhere we look. How are we going to deal with it? And there's a deeper dysfunction, isn't there? There's an eternal, there's an existential dysfunction because I am dysfunctional because I want to be God and I don't do a good job of it. This dysfunction is the parent of all dysfunction. And here we have a template for how it will be dealt with. We've got to see that Joseph and his brothers are the pattern. Joseph is like God, knowing and initiating everything. His brothers are like us. Just as God knows and deals in severe mercy, so Joseph does. And there is restoration and reconciliation. And God alone initiates it. God alone initiates it in a severe mercy, which brings us to guilt which brings us to fear, which brings us to sorrow. There is the pattern for how to deal with dysfunction and to bring reconciliation, guilt and fear and sorrow before God. And for it to happen in all of our lives, it's got to happen vertically. If it doesn't happen between us and God, it's not going to happen in here. If it doesn't happen between us and God, as we recognise that we have rejected God, we've sinned against God, and we need to come back to God, that dysfunction horizontally is not going to happen, not going to be solved. But once we've done business with God, we can do it horizontally, can't we? 
You see, for those of us who've caused the dysfunction, the hurt, we need to com- face what we've committed. We need to do business with God. And we need to know that the relationship can be restored. For those of us who've experienced that hurt, and we all have, we know that we can initiate it, this reconciliation, in kindness and restoration and a deep desire for forgiveness. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you for the way in which it confronts us, but not just confronts us, but provides us with healing. Father, help us to know where we stand before you. Vertically help our dysfunction of sin to be dealt with by your grace. And so, Father, please prompt us horizontally to do the same. Father, none of this is easy, and you have borne the great cost for us in your Son. Please enable us to come back to you through him. Amen. It's no mistake that we're going to move into prayer now before we sing our final song. And as we do, the words of Romans 3 remind us of that vertical state we have before God. Since there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, we are all dysfunctional in our sin. And so I want to invite you now to come before God as a group of people and ask him for his forgiveness, knowing that template we have just looked at. So please join with me in this prayer of confession. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have often gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way. For the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Here is the assurance. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as a propitiation, taking the severe mercy on himself through faith in his blood, to demonstrate his righteousness. Because of that good news, we are right with God, turning to him in Christ. And so we can come before God and call him Father. We're going to do that now in the family prayer, and then I'm going to lead us in three short prayers. Together, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to pray through Psalm 84, three short prayers that match the salahs in that psalm. Father, you made this world and you made us as your image bearers. You made us to dwell with you, and nothing is so good as living in your presence. Forgive us for choosing to live outside your house. Forgive us through your kindness. Forgive us for the damage and dysfunction our sin brings. And thank you, Father, that through your Son, you open the door and you bring us back into your house, completely restored and forgiven. In your kingdom, Father, there is a good place for the smallest and the greatest, for the weakest and the strongest, for the babies and the children, the teenagers and young adults, for the families and those who are older, because of the severe mercy of Jesus. Father, please create in us a contentment for dwelling with you. Please help us to proclaim this goodness throughout the world and please protect us from being distracted from living in your house. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we're looking forward to the day when Jesus comes back. Until that day, help us to walk as a faithful witness to him. We pray that we will affect the world around us as we do this, proclaiming and practising Jesus in all we do. This week, 
Give us an opportunity to proclaim Jesus. This week, help us to be generous and kind and patient, humble and contented and winsome, truthful and honest and open and gracious and merciful. Father, help us to be springs of living water in whatever valley we walk through because of Jesus. And we pray this for your people wherever they are in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we live in a broken world that will be renewed one day. As we wait for that day, help us to live now eternally. Father, you have given us eternal restoration, and so we pray that that will navigate the world we live in now. In a broken world, for those who mourn, give an assurance of your defeat of death in Jesus Christ. For those who are lonely, provide the community of yourself and your people. For those who are addicted, please free them through the work of Jesus. For those who are marginalised, please bring them into the warmth of community with Christ. For those struggling with sin, please open their eyes to Christ's victory. For those restless with discontentment, provide rest in the Lord and Saviour who provides everything. In Jesus' name, amen.